similar to Eliza in creating low impact vegetative buffers or stormwater treatment techniques or more, more innovative strategies. There's one thing that I think we can all agree on right now, and that's collaboration is going to be the key to success here. And uh, I'm not going to go on much longer, but before I turn it over to Doug, I just want to share with you I have a quote that I like. It's probably my favorite quote about common sense. Here it goes. One thing is sure, we have to do something. We have to do the best we know how at the moment. If it doesn't turn out right, we can modify it as we go along. And that's by Franklin Roosevelt. And I don't know what the context was for that quote, but I think it's a really a perfect example of where we're at in terms of we solve the problems in Lake Montau. There's really, there's a commitment, there's an urgency, and there's a lot of collaboration going on right now. So it's very exciting, and I think we can all agree that there's going to be some progress in addressing the problems at hand. So on behalf of the Southern Member Voluntary Council, I certainly look forward to working with you all to do the very best we can to restore our shared resources. <laughs> That's a directional mic, so you have to speak. Thank you very much, Bill. That's a great introduction. I'm very pleased and uh, taken aback by uh, you know, just the opportunity to be here. I wanted to thank the Friends of Lake Quantapowit, as well as the Bear Hill <coughs> Golf Club for the opportunity to talk tonight. And tonight we're going to go down uh, memory lane. We're going to look at history. Uh, history of the lake is very complicated and diverse, but I think after this talk, you'll have a better sense as to why the lake is the way it is why it's sometimes clear you know, on spring and fall days and quite murky in other times. Uh, okay, I'll, talk, I'll try to talk a little closer and a little louder. Is that better? I, I'm told this is a directional mic, so uh, we'll, we'll make best use of it. Uh, behind me are a number of books here, and they were compiled beginning in the 1990s when I was a member of Friends of the Lake Quinnipiac on the board, working with Jim Scott and Meg Michaels and Karen Failer and many other people. And we started to compile information because one of the things I realized was there was not one place which had a repository for lake history. And so I thought that putting together a scrapbook based on old news stories, documents, of uh, magazine articles and so forth, as well as uh, actual scientific data, would be a benefit to the community. So behind me 
are all these large volumes. Volumes 1, 2, and 3. This one dates from 500 BC to 1949. <laughs> Volume 2 is 1950 to 1999. And 3 is 2000 to the present. So this one is also filling up fast. <laughs> as, uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, we also had written a book on Lake Quanah Palette, which came out in 2011. It's one of the Arcadia Images of America series, and I really encourage you to uh, get a copy. Uh, they're for sale tonight if you'd like to have a signed copy, or they're also available in, in the BB Library and other the local libraries in the area. Not far from Lake Quanapau is Breakar Reservation, which we uh, did about a, a year later. A fascinating area, mostly in Saugus, which also touches on Wakefield, but it's got a, a very interesting history as to how 600 acres managed to escape development you know, for many decades and actually be purchased by the state in the 1930s. And then finally, our, the last book we've just uh, had published uh, back in March is Middlesex Fells. And this was by, by far our most ambitious and most interesting project. It encompasses over 3,000 acres covering five towns. And it was uh, one of the parks in eastern Massachusetts that was in the forefront for the Metropolitan Park Commission, which was the first commission in the United States to set up state parks. So a really important area, and I encourage you to visit it as well. Let's see. I have to find my, uh, let's see, my advancer, my presenter. Let's see. <laughs> no, I don't need money. <laughs> Let's see, where did it go? Uh, oh, here it is. Okay, we're going to take a uh, look at lake history in a historical context. What does the past tell us about today's challenges? Most of us are familiar with Lake Quantapallet. It looks like this. This is the outfall on Lowell and Main Streets. And for the last several summers, in fact, many summers, it looks like this. Algae is the main culprit, and what algae feed on as a plant form is phosphorus. So what we're going to discover tonight is where all the phosphorus came from. Why has it affected the lake the way it does? We're going to discover that it is a watershed-based problem, and that possible solutions will also be watershed-based. We're going to go back in time. The Pawcatuck and early Massachusetts tribes, as shown in this uh, diorama, occupied the area here for thousands of years. They camped in the winter, usually in the inland woodland sites, as shown here. They were migratory. They used wigwams for shelter. They lived off the land. There was plenty of game. Lake Quanapalit itself was teeming with fish every spring thousands of alewife and salmon would come up the Saugus River and spawn the Lake Quanapallet. During the summer months, they would move down to the shoreline on the coastal areas. The Indians, of course, uh, you know, faded out in the 1600s. Uh, the key uh, tribes, the Pawcatuck and Massachusetts tribe, were headed by Squaw Sachem, who inherited the area after her husband, Nana Peshma, died in 1619. And a lot of this history is better described in our book on Middlesex Fells. So in 16, uh, 1600s, European colonists arrived in eastern Massachusetts. This is a map of Wakefield and Reading Pond, it was then called in 1647. And there are a number of uh, homesteads and small farms as you can see, that were arrayed in the southern part and eastern part of Lake Quanapallet. This is fertile ground for farms, and a community began to develop. And in doing my family tree, I discovered that uh, Nicholas Brown, who arrived in Lynn and then traveled up the Saugus River as one of the first uh, settlers in Wakefield, lived in this house right here, number 18. So he's my uh, great uncle. You know, several times removed. So it's wonderful to have you know, ties to the area. 
So what did the colonists do with wastewater? Now they were, there were several possibilities. One was to dig a hole in the ground. This is an example of a cesspool. Cesspools were typically 10 to 20 feet deep, lined with brick or stone. Our other alternatives were you know, privies like this. And so for hundreds of years, from colonial days all the way until, as I'll show, the early 20th century, people relied on these devices you know, to take care of their you know, sanitary needs. This is a map of uh, the area in 1725. Here's the lake here. And as you can see, more and more settlement has occurred in Wakefield. Early colonists first clustered the southern part of the, of the lake around 1639, and then gradually moved outward as more and more uh, farming area became available and woods were cut down. We're also beginning to see more settlement up in here uh, for the early uh, settlement of Reading in the early you know, 18th century. In 1874, uh, the southern part of Lake Quinnipiac was much more congested, much more settled. The railroad had come in in 1845, in this area here, bringing industry and goods uh, both to and from Boston markets. Ice houses uh, appeared in 18, 1848. The Boston Ice Company was the first to locate on the western shore of Lake Quinnipiac and it was there for the express purpose of collecting ice during the winter months and the ice would be shipped down to hotels and also shipments to the Orient and as far away as India under Frederick Tudor's uh, you know, ice program, ice marketing. So at this time, Wakefield was growing you know, quite quickly, but as, as you can tell, or maybe it's not so obvious, it was not sewered. Everybody relied on cesspools or privies. Your, your, your house is there, Jim? It should be, yeah. It should be, yeah. yeah. It burned down in 1906, wasn't it? You gave me that. It burned down in 1906? Yeah. Okay. You gave me that information. Right, right, right. And then was rebuilt. So Wakefield, like most towns in northern, you know, eastern Massachusetts, uh, we're growing very quickly, more and more settlers coming in, industry was uh, developing. And by 1883, the area looked like this. This is a topographic map showing uh, both the land relief as well as the drainage in the area. And as you can see, there were several areas of streams, about three tributaries over this area which drained directly into Lake Quantapowit and then what another stream called the head of Saugus River, which drained into the, the western part, as it still does to some extent. So this gives us an opportunity to understand just, you know, what is the large area that actually contributed water to Lake Quantapowit? A watershed is simply the land area contributing water to a water body. And at this time, it was uh, over four square miles. Weeds started uh, appearing in Lake Quinnipiac in the literature in the 1880s. In fact, this was a news story in 1951 that it was uh, first found around 1884, disrupting boating, swimming, fishing, and so forth. By 1889, uh, most of the area, you know, sur actually surrounding the watershed in Lake Quinnipiac look like this. This black line here is the actual division line of the watershed. So every time it rained, it flowed, you know, to lake from this direction. The areas down in this part of Wakefield were all draining down to the Mill River and then out to the Saugus River to the southern part of town. The red arrows are the groundwater flow direction. So if you can imagine, all of these houses here are on privies or cesspools, and which were devices to inject you know, wastewater directly into uh, the aquifer, and then that slowly moved into the lake. And this is one of the key reasons why phosphorus built up in the lake sediments as much as it does 
and continues to recycle into the overburden, over, uh, overlying water column every year, creating a lot of plant life and algae growth. This is an example of the cross connection between, you know, septic systems or, you know, privies in this case and cesspools being too close to wells and affecting water quality. Many people didn't realize the connection between uh, sanitary waste and affecting drinking water quality and the impacts on health. Gradually, as uh, the 18th century and 19th century went on, a great understanding occurred and more and more separation was uh, created between the two. And another key advance was the development of the sewer systems. Wakefield was one of the first towns in the area to develop its own sewer system beginning in 1901. And in fact, this is a map here from the actual town report of uh, 1902 in the Beebe Library showing the extent of connections by 1904 of the existing you know, sewer lines and the streets that were uh, maintained at that time. So all the streets pretty much within this part of the watershed uh, had sewer lines, but only a little more than 40% of the houses by this time were actually connected. And it took many, many more years before people were able to connect their houses and systems to existing sewer lines mostly because they were happy with what they had. They were uh, concerned about the expense of hooking up and so forth. But again, it just goes to show that it took many years for you know, connections to actually occur. This is a copy of the Daily Item uh, of 1908, showing that there are many weeds in Lake Quinnipowat, many of them, and they bother canoeists to remove them would be costly. Some articles actually uh, talked about the laying of sewer lines in town. This is an example of from 1932, saying that a sewer will be laid from Church Street northward to Wind Street. So there was no sewer line from Church to Wind Street until the 1930s. And on the east side, uh, there was no sewer line extending from, you know, Sweetser <coughs> all the way up to Cordes and Central Streets on, on Lakeside until 1937. So many, many years passed uh, before sanitary surveys can actually intercept you know, sanitary waste and direct it away from the lake. Up in Reading, uh, things occurred a bit later. In fact, Reading was about two decades behind Wakefield. The sewer system that Reading proposed in 1916 was only partial, partially operational in January 1922. And this is an actual map from an annual town report showing all the streets that were proposed to have sewer lines you know, sometime in the future. But many, many years passed before uh, enough of the houses were actually hooked up to it to make much of a difference. And as you recall from an earlier map, that all this area right here is all draining down to Lake Quinnipowat, which is down right here. There are three main tributaries. This one, which is the Charles Street Brook, the Salem Street Brook, and then the Haven Street Brook over here, which now goes, flows past uh, Market Basket, you know, draining into one tributary and falling right into Lake Quinnipowat. So the key point here is that decades pass before uh, there was sufficient amount of houses connected to actual sewer systems to intercept you know, sanitary waste rather than have it all drain into Lake Quinnipowat. But the damage had already largely been done. Uh, much of the aquifer and groundwater is already saturated with, with phosphorus, which is slowly moving toward the lake and probably still continues to do so to this day. Here is a, a close-up of that earlier map and I was able to put down the actual dates where the sewer lines, you know, went in. And then connections would slowly occur, you know, many years after that. So John Street, for example, which is right here, uh, was not actually sewer until the 1930s. 
and parts of Salem Street, 1920s and the 1970s, over in this direction. <coughs> and then the track road area, if you remember where that is, that's where the old racetrack that was, that was operated in the 1890s to about 1920 or so, that was not sewered until 1973 by the town of Reading. So many years passed before you know, sanitary surveys actually were able to uh, make a difference environmentally. This is a graph showing the percentage of house connections in the Reading sewer system from 1921 to 1959. The system actually begins operation down here in 1922, but only a few streets have sewers, and only a few connections have been made. In 1925, only about half of, of the house connections have been made in Reading. And in 1941, back over here, there was still a third of all the houses in Reading without any sewer system. So again, you have all this stuff going into the ground uh, continually over, over many years. The Reading Drainage Canal, which uh, was finally developed in 1943 and 44, uh, opens way down here, as I'll show in a minute. So there were a lot of problems. By the 1920s, uh, we began to see heavy growth of algae you know, throughout the lake. And this created noxious conditions, uh, bad smells, and many complaints. And so the Board of Selectmen uh, took action and decided that a scientific study would best be uh, made to understand just what is going on. Some selectmen believed that the, the green of the, on the lake was actually pollen blowing in from the wetlands. But this was not the case. Weston Sampson, who had been a long-term contractor for the town, uh, wrote uh, in a letter report in December 1927, and I'll quote, the profuse growth of algae is supported by the food material which is waste into the lake from the densely populated catchment area, which is tributary to it. Pollution includes the storm drainage and industrial waste which discharge into the northerly end of the lake and the seepage from cesspools located near the lake in unsewered districts, as I've already shown. The three brooks entering the lake through the swampy area at the northern end carry considerable pollution, which has its origin in the town of Reading. They also examined algae over a period of months and found that this was one of the main species, a blue-green algae called uh, Celestrum. <coughs> and Anabena was also quite prevalent and it's still prevalent today. They recommended that copper sulfate be applied to the lake to combat the algae. Copper sulfate is a bluish green material, it's usually a powder, and it would be towed behind a boat in burlap bags for um, about a day or so, and up to 2,000 pounds would be used for a given treatment. And sometimes, if necessary, the treatment would, do three, would be done three times a summer. Copper is uh, toxic to algae, it inhibits photosynthesis, and so it is effective in killing the algae where it all died and settled to the bottom. So in part, this resulted in a clear lake that was much more uh, conducive for swimming, boating, fishing, and all the uses people were uh, you know, quite used to it by that point. Copper sulfate was applied from 1927 all the way to about 1973 almost on a yearly basis. So a lot of copper went into the lake, and a lot of copper is down in the sediments right now. This is an example of the change in watersheds as a result of uh, culverting and channelizing the tributaries that used to be in the northern part of the lake. As I mentioned, there is a Charles Street Brook up here, and then the Salem Street Brook, which crosses Salem Street about this location, and then the Haven Street Brook right in this area. They were able to identify uh, several key pollution sources, uh, one of which was the Reading Custom Laundry uh, on John Street down in this area, and then also Haven Street Laundry more in downtown just west of Main Street. The sudsy wastewater would be uh, dumped on the area behind the laundries and they would just drain into the tributaries over many, many years, starting about the 1890s all the way to the 1930s. 
and up to 5,000 gallons a day would be disposed of this way. Because you have to remember there were no clear environmental laws at this point. And unless you know, people got really sick, uh, a lot of practices, especially behind buildings, were, were allowed and occurred. But it took its toll, because uh, wastewater had a lot of phosphorus in it, and this was making its way to Lake Quinnipau, too. In fact, uh, news headlines uh, mention the problem. The water board engineers find brooks from Reading Laundry spring sewage promoting the growth of algae. And this is from January of 1928. They suggested that a permanent dam be built at the outfall, because at this point, the dam and lake level was controlled by a sawmill on Vernon Street. And it wasn't until 1928-29 when the outfall was built that we see today to control the lake level. It wasn't until August 1936 where the Reading Board of Health finally took action to threaten the laundries with either closure or they have to you know, hook up to the sewer lines. And there were sewer lines, they were right there, but they were reluctant. In fact, the Reading Custom Laundry uh, refused to hook up and they decided to leave town. In 1940, the uh, town of Reading initiated a state-funded program to channelize and provide culverts for the tributaries that originally went into Lake Winnipeg from the north. They would drain the lake marsh by a series of ditches. They felt that the wetlands was a source of disease and unhealthy conditions, and that by draining the area, that would eliminate the problem as well as provide more real estate for development. <clears throat> this is the area in question. It's all these, this is from 1938, showing absolutely no, no development except for track road over here. It's pretty much devoid of any houses, any construction. This is North Avenue right here, Quinnipau Parkway at the north end. So all this area was considered ripe for development and channelizing the brooks was thought the best way to do it. So they proceeded. This is a map of the Quantipowitz drainage project area from the Reading Annual Town Report of 1941, showing the 2,300 acres that would originally drain to Lake Quantipow and be cut off and diverted northeastward, meeting the Saugus River downstream of Lake Quantipow. So instead of having over four square miles of watershed, Lake Quantipow had and now just less than one, supplying water to it. This is a 1974 aerial photograph showing the uh, channelized brooks as they existed back then. And maybe interested, this is the uh, John Street dump, which is now under uh, Jordan's Furniture and Home Depot, and Route 128. And this is the track road area, which had this year had just been uh, sewered, finally. And up here are a whole number of greenhouses, which existed for many years. And now it's a, uh, a subdivision. When you go to the uh, uh, actual channel area, it looks like this. This is the view looking east from track road. So it's a very quiet area, the channels are very straight, and the only time that you see any fast movement is during heavy rainfall events. And you have to remember at this location, it is, is you know, channeling the uh, combined uh, watershed of, a, of about three square miles at this point that formerly went into Lake Quinnipawit. Finally, in the 30s, uh, Wakefield began starting, installing storm drains. Up until the 30s, most of the roads you know, were either dirt or unpaved and not conducive to putting in curbing and you know, catch basins to channelize stormwater flow into the lake. However, with the advent of the automobile and trucks, uh, more and more pavement occurred, more impervious surface, and storm drains were thought to be the most way, conducive way to channelize rainwater uh, away from pavement and cars and trucks into the lake. So when you think of it, the lake is really a low-lying sump 
for large areas of, of stormwater. By the 1960s, there were about 30 drains, as shown here, much of them on the east side of the lake. <clears throat> this is uh, storm drain number six. The Camp Dresser McKee, in its feasibility study of 1986, uh, documented all the storm drains and gave them numbers. This is the one down that's on the common, and it's one of the, the largest in terms of flow and, and catchment area. This is uh, Dick Dennis and Roy Mars of FLOQ, measuring Lake Quality in 1993. FLOQ, of course, uh, started around 1991, and one of its uh, key objectives was to understand lake water quality better. You know, what is causing the various problems in the lake and what can be done about it. So they initiated a summertime sampling and analysis program that is continuing to this day. One of the things we did is back in the 90s was we set up a storm force and we've actually looked at you know, stormwater quality, uh, the whole number of, of uh, storm drains at that time. I know Bill Butler was involved as well. This is the flow at the end of Corda Street back in July 19th, 1999 as an example. And I timed this just using a five gallon bucket and a stopwatch to get the flow. And as you can see, after the flow started, we had a very fast response, going up to about 400 gallons a minute coming out of a small eight inch pipe. We also analyzed uh, phosphorus, taking about you know, seven to eight samples and came up with this graph. And the water quality was in phosphorus was quite high, almost 400 parts per billion. Normally in a lake, you want to have about 15 parts per billion uh, to uh, maintain a healthy lake that's clear and free from you know, excess plant growth. Storm drains were contributing a great deal of phosphorus, primarily as dust particles from uh, paved surfaces, from people's lawns, and other sources. So every time it rained, we would end up with a, a huge shot of phosphorus going to the lake. And this was just one storm drain. Here's a photograph of uh, Bill Butler and I uh, doing uh, another sampling run. Besides storm drains, we decided to look at sediment as well. And so we took a number of sediment samples. <clears throat> and this is a map showing the various sampling locations, you know, about six of them in the lake. And the concentrations in phosphorus, which is the larger number here, in parts per billion in milligrams per kilogram. In October 1999, we collected sediment samples and found high phosphorus levels you know, throughout the lake, you know, highly enriched. And so this helped to explain why we're getting internal recycling of phosphorus every summer you know, feeding plant life. Besides all the phosphorus coming into the lake from surrounding storm drains, we also had the sediment itself, which had developed over many, many years from all the poor wastewater practices over you know, decades. <clears throat> we actually had a chance to take a sediment core sample in January 2001. Here I am standing in the ice and I had to collect about a two and a half foot long core. We had questions about how fast the lake was filling up. Uh, some people thought the lake would become a meadow within a few years if something wasn't done. So by taking core samples and analyzing uh, the various concentrations of key things like metals and other uh, constituents with depth, we would have an idea of just how fast the lake is actually accreting. And we found that not surprisingly there was high levels of phosphorus in the upper, upper level usually about the upper two or three inches of sediment. And then below that were the more natural background levels. So the, the more superficial uh, concentrations at the, at the top of the sediments were as much as you know, 10 to 15 times higher than background levels. And this was also true for lead, as well as copper and arsenic, which was deposited back in the 1960s to control weed growth. 
A water quality committee was started uh, just a little over a year ago in March 2014. The Board of Selectmen appointed a group of uh, concerned citizens, including Jim Scott here and Bill Butler, and then Bill... Uh, is that actually a picture of some of the members? It, <laughs> yes, it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Mike Collins agreed to uh, you know, chair the committee. Is that Mike Collins in the middle? It, it's whatever you want to make it, Jim. <laughs> and so we are tasked with finding out, you know, what is the problem with the lake and what are the remedies? And so we're going to look at a, a large list of, you know, possible solutions. Uh, some people felt that, you know, dredging might be a, a key way of getting rid of the enriched, you know, phosphorus and nutrient levels within the lake. However, um, this was ruled out way back in 1988, you know, 27 years ago by CDM. For one thing, they found it was way too costly. Uh, we're talking about, you know, tons and tons of wet sediment that would have to be processed and taken somewhere else. There are also high levels of arsenic, which makes it a hazardous waste, which even makes it more expensive. But they found that the, the key thing, as outlined down here, was uh, that, you know, storm drains, uh, are one of the main culprits and that, you know, stormwater should be intercepted and treated on a watershed basis to remove the phosphorus coming in. The best ideas are promoted by all stormwater manuals and the key things to remember is they mostly involve infiltration, filtering and absorption to get rid of uh, pollutants in lake water. And they typically include the entire watershed. You can't just concentrate on the waterfront and shoreline and expect to have much of a difference. You've got to look at the entire picture and what's coming in. For example, we've been looking at alum or aluminum sulfate. This is a compound that you put in with a device such as this over you know, a day or so. They usually uh, is directed by GPS on a grid basis to uh, allow the even spreading of a coating of alum on top of the sediment. The sediment would be uh, treated in such a way that the alum would encapsulate the phosphorus and absorb it and, and bind with it to create aluminum phosphates and therefore removing phosphorus from the water column and hopefully reducing the amount of algae. However, it's quite expensive. A typical alum treatment for a lake the size of Lake Quinnipaw would be as much as one and a half million dollars. The, the, the benefit is though that it would last you know, as much as eight years before another treatment would have to occur. <clears throat> we also looked at bee mats, and these were floating wetlands that you could create, usually on a, a plastic substrate. They would uh, sit out in the lake during most of the growing season, and then you'd harvest them and take them you know, to a landfill or compost them. They would sit in the water and absorb you know, excess phosphorus in the water. So this is one way of uh, getting it out. We looked at uh, stormwater treatment. Uh, Mike Collins and I went up to the UNH Stormwater Center, which is one of the world's top uh, tr trial uh, test areas for stormwater technologies in the world. And some of the things they recommend are uh, storm scepters like this, where you'd have a catch basin, capture runoff, and go into a, a container such as this, usually swirl around a number of times. It could be treated by a uh, particular medium that would absorb you know, uh, phosphorus and also litter and debris. And then cleaner water would come out at the other end to, be, to flow into the lake. There are a whole number of technologies like this, and some are effective and some are not but they again would be expensive. If the, they were installed, uh, DPW would be tasked to maintain these because they would have to be cleaned out on a periodic basis in order to be effective. We also looked at uh, vegetative barriers and it's a, a simple and effective role in reducing and filtering out runoff as well as uh, goose control. This is an example of uh, the common where you have as much as 760 feet of open shoreline that's quite welcoming to birds such as geese because they can readily swim both from the you know, water into the grass and then from the grass back to the water. There's no barrier to, 
to uh, stop them from doing what they love to do. <clears throat> this is uh, Hall Park in Veterans Field, on the west side looking south. It also has a very low vegetative barrier. And what the town could do very effectively is just not mow the, the shoreline within two feet of the water, allow it to rise up uh, two or three feet, and this would help you know, dissuade the geese from landing in the area and flocking there as much as they do. Bill Butler here has been uh, goose counting for many years. And uh, I don't know, Bill, are they decreasing in number or not, or are they just as bad as ever? About the same. They're about the same. So this would be a, a cheap and inexpensive way for the town to uh, help you know, control geese as well as provide a filtering uh, mechanism here when you have sheet runoff uh, you know, flowing from inland areas into the lake water. And that's just one of the things we're looking at. When you look at the whole shoreline of the lake, uh, vegetative buffers um, should be placed in about 9% of the shoreline, over 760 feet on the common, lesser amount for Hall Park. The Clarion Inn had a you know, very high uh, level of vegetative barriers, but there were gaps uh, which were unexplained, about three of them combined to be 29 feet. <laughs> and then the northern shore has um, a number of gaps as well, up near the Converse property, and the beach has about 100 feet. So these could be um, you know, replanted and left to, by themselves to uh, help control geese and provide a filtering mechanism. <clears throat> We've also been looking at rain gardens. And these are other you know, simple uh, projects that would uh, reduce the amount of stormwater runoff. Um, it would slow down runoff and there'd be less pollution because more and more rainwater, instead of being channeled to streets and into storm drains into the lake, would actually go into the ground for its natural filtration properties. More water would also go in to replenish groundwater supplies and improve the overall landscape. This is just an example of one that captures rain from a parking lot and nearby roads. And just another example of a rain garden next to a parking lot. They're also quite beautiful, as you can see. Curb cuts, simple uh, devices to allow flow uh, from paved surfaces into uh, absorbing uh, you know, grassland and other vegetation could be easily done. The key thing is to reduce the amount of stormwater going into the lake. Porous pavement is another technology that's gained a lot of favor in the last several years and is uh, woefully underused. Whenever you have new projects in town regarding parking areas, driveways, and even sidewalks, uh, it'd be helpful to have a town-wide ordinance requiring that porous pavement be put in to again reduce the amount of you know, stormwater. And some examples include um, areas like this. They're all different kinds. If you Google uh, porous pavement, You'll see hundreds of images of various kinds of materials that can be readily used. They also make great materials for you know, driveways. Here's an example right here at the bottom showing porous pavement right next to the sidewalk. They're best used for parking areas. Uh, they're not as effective for high traffic zones. <clears throat> and this is uh, my final slide. Uh, one small step for walkers, one giant step for Wakefield. I think that once the uh, Lake uh, Water Quality Committee wraps up its work, uh, maybe in about a year or so, we'll have you know, greater answers as to what will work best for our you know, beautiful lake and how to reduce the overall phosphorus levels in it. But I think the key, key thing to remember is it took you know, decades and decades of, of buildup of pollutants to create the problem we have. It may well take you know, many years before we see actual reductions in you know, pollution in the lake as well as the algae blooms that we experience every year. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs> yes? It goes down to the, uh, the MWRA. In fact, uh, everybody here you know, we've had dinner tonight, and all going to end up in Boston Harbor. 
one way or the other. <laughs> yes, goes out to Deer Island. The, the main sewer in town, I think, uh, goes down Main Street to Melrose, and then, you know, beyond that. Doug, um, yes. before they had that back when you were talking about the sewage first being put in, where did that, was there a, a water treatment plant here in Wakefield, and you saw how did they treat it? Was there chemicals or aeration? There were water treatment plants uh, both in Wakefield and Reading for drinking water. And uh, the one in Reading started about 1890. The Quantipal Water Company at Crystal Lake started about 1883 or so. But, what about but there were, the sewage, the sewage was uh, allowed to go down to, you know, into Melrose. It fed into a main, main trunk line, as it does today. So there was a metropolitan uh, you know, sewer facility, I think, in more in the Boston area at that time. Right, right. But it wasn't really treated to the extent that it is now, like in Deer Island, as uh, since in the, you know, about 1990 or so, under court order. So it was, it was a major problem, and it was mostly out of sight, out of mind. But I hope that, that some of the images here uh, make you realize that it was a long-term problem, that, you know, people relied on privies and cesspools for decades before anything was actually done. We do. There's one uh, the, on Broadway on, at the north end of Crystal Lake. Um, Crystal Lake is, is a low-pressure zone. It supplies most of the downtown area of Wakefield. The rest of Wakefield is supplied by the MWRA, and that's, you know, Wachusa Reservoir and Quabbin Reservoir. There are about 43 communities within the MWRA system around Boston, and over 2 million people you know, use the, the system itself. And it has some of the best water, I think, in the country. Yes. I live near Crystal Lake, and it strikes me that it's almost the same size as Lake Quantipout, but you don't see part of it. And it's still being used for drinking water? It is. And are the two lakes related in any way? Because there's a creek that runs underground where the new uh, middle school is, and there's also a creek that runs, that when I do walking, mm -hmm. it goes from Bartley Street and meanders down. That's Wakefield Brook. Wakefield Brook. Right. It actually uh, flows right next to my house on Stedman Street, up in Wakefield Park area. Wakefield Brook is a tributary to the Mill River. And in the old days, it did flow directly into Crystal Lake until about 1890, when concerns about its uh, pollution um, were finally addressed by diverting it you know, under the Galvin School, and then out uh, where the Haywood Mills used to be on, on Water Street and into the Mill River from there. So it, it was a problem until about 1890 or so. I have one more point to make. There was something about uh, recently there was <coughs> over, overgrowth in some sort of a, um, an area that was near a condo development. And the, they've decided that the, it was the lawn uh, feeding that affected it. But oh, I mean, I mean Heron Pond? Yeah. Heron Pond area. Right. Is that it? But the thing that struck me was that it was hardly, um, they only chose one site in which to restrict all of these fertilizers. Now, all of Wakefield practically uses lawn chemicals. They come around and fertilize like six times a year. I don't know how many people here have, not, probably not in this group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My neighbor certainly mm -hmm. does. It seems to me it's so systemic that the whole town should absolutely have these decrees not to use this stuff. Well, I think one of the things we've learned in the committee is that, um, and Dennis Fazio, who is you know, head of the, uh, the park division for DPW, and who's in charge of, of you know, lawn mowing and, and lawn treatments, uh, they use very little fertilizer, and in fact, um, I think that you know phosphorus and fertilizer is now being you know banned in Massachusetts, as I understand. So it's going to become a, a much less of a problem than it was in the past. Public land, isn't that correct? That's right. I mean, private people can do anything they want, and they do. 
Well, didn't the state just pass a law recently that they I think they did, yes. Right. Fertilizer, so it's all organic, you can't get it now. Right, it's slow release, uh, it's organic, and it's you know, much less than we had in the past. Except that private people I see all around me, I mean, I take walks everywhere through Wakefield, mm -hmm. all you can smell is the pesticides, and probably this golf course is probably, who knows, in danger, but you can smell it everywhere. Um, I know some towns have banned it completely. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, well, I recommend uh, you know talking to dentists and to see what their actual practices are, yeah. and just what are what's required in town, what what's allowed. It's not just the fertilizers; there's the pesticides and herbicides, which I think are right. You know, for weed, weed control mostly, right? Uh, yes, yeah. Bill. Well, I was going to say, Doug, that uh, the state did pass legislation, like many other states, to ban phosphorus, the use of phosphorus, but they haven't rolled out how to implement the rule yet, so effectively they have the law, but they don't have it in place. Uh, when it does roll out, it will make homeowners <coughs> responsible for limited phosphorus, certain conditions, starter lawns, uh, certain My other person. conditions, very limited. Mm -hmm. So if you're contracting someone, you have, you're responsible for that contractor to use zero phosphorus for their fertilization of their lawns. It doesn't speak to any other chemicals or other treatments, but mm -hmm. it is, uh, pr prospectively, it's gonna be something uh, you know, that'll be very, very beneficial. And if you look now on phosphorus bags at most retailers and most commercial com uh, fertilizer bags, they have the middle number is a zero. So mm -hmm. companies are now catching on to this because it's not only Lake Quantipog, but it's around the country. Right, right. So I think you're gonna see improvement, but if it is implemented, it will be up to the homeowner who's responsible that their contractor is uh, compliant with the law. Right. The law is not in place, but the, you know, prospectively, I think people are starting to. Uh, right. I know FLOQ has had a long-term program of trying to educate you know, um, citizens of Wakefield and residences to restrict them out of lawn fertilizer because it just ends up in the lake one way or the other. Uh, yes, Meg. What about the salt in the wintertime that mm -hmm. they just dump by the lake? Yeah. Well, well, public, public safety sometimes trump, you know, um, water quality in lakes. Uh, I've been analyzing, you know, the salt levels of the lake for some time. And actually, they've gone down slightly. I don't know if it's because uh, we've had, you know, wetter winters. Certainly, the last winter was, was one, one of record. Um, it's much higher than it was, you know, 30, 40 years ago, but it doesn't seem to be increasing because I guess it's the amount of dilution, you know, within the watershed. But it is a problem, and salt is the most effective way to uh, melt ice in the winter and reduce the amount of, you know, uh, stuff that has to be removed by the, by the road crews every year. Uh, it's, and, and it will be used, you know, for some time to come because it's the only economically feasible way to do it. It's far cheaper than than other chemicals. So it is a concern and we're, we're monitoring it, uh, but it's going to be here as long as we have winter, I'm afraid, for some time to come. Uh, yes? Yeah. On the runoff that goes into the lake, what are the prime contaminants of the runoff that goes into the lake? And has that changed significantly over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years when it actually does get in there? I don't think it's changed so much. Uh, if you think of cars and trucks, every time they pass by, they leave uh, <coughs> molecules in their exhaust. These end up on paved surfaces, you know, like roads and parking lots, and then they can be transported every time it next time it rains. There are also volatile organic compounds. There are polyaromatic hy hydrocarbons, you know, PAHs. The metals such as uh, copper, lead, and zinc from machinery and brake linings, these end up in the water also as well as nutrients like nitrates and phosphorus. Then there's a tremendous amount of, uh, unfortunately, plastic litter, cigarette butts, uh, you know, bottles that we find. If you go to a storm drain after a you know, significant rainfall, go down there and look at what's around it, everything on the streets ends up you know, in the right place, and unfortunately right in the lake. So the lake for decades has been you know, perceiving these, uh, this pollution for some time. And until we have storm scepter devices to uh, clean out the, the storm water before it reaches the lake, that's going to continue, unfortunately. But no, I, th I don't think it's changed much. The main uh, change is the, um, the lack of lead and gasoline. 
the 1970s. So we, that's not as big an issue as it was in the past. But everything else, I think, is pretty much the same because cars and trucks basically emit the same kind of pollutants. Yes, Jim? We had a tremendous water shortage in Crystal Lake in the late 1950s, middle 1950s. And we actually set up a mm -hmm. pumping station on Lake Corner Power and pumped out of that. I was with the power company then we helped set up the pumping station. Right. <coughs> so as, after that, we went into the MDC, which is now the Mass Water Resources. But we did drink a lot of water out of that mm -hmm. lake. Jim is talking about um, the pumping station down near Lawrence, Lawrence Street, in 1957. At that time, Crystal Lake was the main supply for Wakefield, and it was getting perilously low. So emergency measures were taken, and uh, amazingly fast permits were issued to allow the use of Lake Powett, which turned out to be a six-month period from August 1st, I think, when it was turned on, until February, when Crystal Lake waters finally rose enough to uh, alleviate the emergency. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of treatment occurred, uh, of lake water? There was a treatment plant right there. There was a regular treatment we plant. We also had two wells in Wakefield, right off of 128, mm -hmm. and down the pit was a well. Right, there was a whole well field at the pit uh, for many years, developed in the 1920s and 30s, and then there was a Bay State well off 128 uh, that was a uh, pretty good supply in the 1940s. And it's still there in the woods, I understand. That's right. So, but we're lucky to have MWRA water. Um, it's a tremendous backup and the far higher quality than what we had in the past. I have a question about the porous conglomerate, um, which would seem to be a very reasonable thing for the walkways around Lake Oh, the porous, porous pavement. pavement, yeah. The porous pavement mm -hmm. um, around Lake Quantipower would create another barrier. Mm -hmm. I can understand maybe not the streets, but what kind of research has there been in terms of um, its durability in this part of the country? Uh, it's found to be quite durable, more than people realize. Uh, there's also uh, something called pervious concrete, which can be applied as well. And that's uh, you know, more durable than the paving stones that I showed in the pictures. It's, it's really underused. I think there are uh, misunderstandings about its cost and maintenance. But once it's there, it has a marked reduction in the uh, amount of stormwater that you would shut off the surface. It also was found to require a lot less salt in the winter for de-icing purposes. There, you wouldn't get the snow and ice buildup that you get on a solid you know, pavement. So it has a lot of benefits and it's something I think uh, towns like Wakefield could really look into and, and require. Because I think uh, right requirement through bylaws and ordinances about the only way that's going to, be going to change the overall practices that we see. Um, as you realize, uh, North Avenue and other streets around the lake have just been recently, you know, torn up and repaved. Uh, one of the problems on North Avenue, and I found this out from Mike Collins, town engineer, was that uh, there were about three sewer line breaks along North Avenue, which had existed for you know, some time, but I'm not quite sure how long. So that probably has an impact on the aquifer, which is flowing into the lake. The, there were very old clay pipes, as an old technology, and once clay breaks, it fractures, and it's, um, it's hard to find you know, in the best of cases. But anyway, that's all repaired now, which is good news. Uh, but the uh, key thing is we have very old infrastructure as I, should, as I mentioned on the old sewer lines that constantly require you know, repair, as well as new technologies we can bring to bear to reduce uh, lake pollution. Yes, Joan. I know you mentioned the uh, Water Quality Committee might be working for another year, so do you have any insights on you know, where are they going from here? Uh, what's the process that they're gonna come up with recommendations? Will there be some mm -hmm. Well, Wakefield, like most towns, is required in the Clean Water Act to come up with, uh, you know, I guess a program to reduce, uh, you know, stormwater pollution in town. And Wakefield certainly is no exception. And I think Mike has mentioned, and Bill, you can correct me if you know that, it'd be about two years, I think, that the town's required to uh, do a lot more monitoring and retrofitting of technologies. 
And so whatever we can come up with a committee would help you know, guide that process as what works, what's feasible, what's cost effective, and so forth. So we're going through a long, long list of you know, possible technologies and solutions. So when that time comes, the town actually hires a contractor to do all the required work. We'll be in a far better place and have more information. One thing that we're probably doing this summer, uh, and this is a suggestion from Bill Butler here, is to do more stormwater you know, sampling. Find out which are the worst stormwater uh, outfalls in the lake and why are they the worst, and then take steps to you know, help remediate those. So that might happen this summer as well. We're also testing uh, the algae itself. Once we get a significant bloom, we plan to have it analyzed by a laboratory down in Florida to look at all the various four different types of toxins that cyanobacteria typically emit, which can cause health problems. And so that will occur also. And Friends of Lake Funapowit is really stepping up to the plate because they decided to fund you know, the testing. So that's really great. So sometime in July and August, we'll take a sample, send it down, and just see just what are the toxin levels? Are they hazardous or are they not? Because the program we've followed you know, through the Saugus River uh, you know, program that we've had over the last several years only looks at you know, one or two different types of toxins and not the full suite. And we really need a detailed laboratory analysis to determine what else might there be. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think I've taken enough of your, your time. <laughs> okay. Thanks to Doug. Uh, you can see the problem is uh, significant, a little bit daunting, but we are working on it with people like Doug, contributions from, from Joan, and uh, and thank you for mentioning uh, FOLQ and, you, and all our members. You are, you are helping the town. Uh, we, are, we are funding uh, parts of the testing and, uh, and uh, certainly supporting with, with four uh, members on the committee uh, the possible solutions. But uh, it's, uh, it's difficult. And uh, dialoguing like we are tonight and getting some information out and if you carry that word, word, uh, word forward there's no obvious solution but we'll keep working on it it's very very important and we can create that critical mass of people talking about improving water quality i think we will all benefit uh it may take a while like that but uh, we'll keep working at it so i i think that's the end of our program uh,